Good afternoon, colleagues. We're going to begin today's business with First Minister's questions, but before we do, I think the First Minister is going to bring us up to date with a short statement. First Minister. Sir, I will give a brief update on today's COVID statistics. I can confirm that an additional 67 cases were confirmed yesterday. That represents 0.5% of people newly tested yesterday and takes the total number of cases now to 19,988. I can also confirm that a total of 249 patients are currently in hospital uh, with confirmed COVID, which is six more than yesterday, and two people are in intensive care, uh, which is an increase of one since yesterday. Unfortunately, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, two deaths were reported to Public Health Scotland of patients who first tested positive in the previous 28 days. This is the first time that any newly registered deaths have been reported in our daily figures since the 16th of July. And it means that the number of deaths under that measurement is now 2,494. I think all of us have become used to hearing news of no deaths under these daily figures. These two new deaths today are, of course, devastating for those who will be grieving the loss. But they should also be a reminder for all of us that the threat of COVID hasn't yet gone away. National Records of Scotland has also just published its weekly update. It includes deaths of people confirmed through a test as having COVID, as our daily figures do, but also cases where COVID is a suspected or contributory cause of death. The latest NRS update covers the period to Sunday 23rd August, and it shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths with either a confirmed or a presumed link to COVID was 4,222. Of those, six deaths were registered in the seven days up to Sunday, which is an increase of three on the week before. Uh, four of those six deaths were in care homes. Uh, the total number of deaths recorded last week from all causes, not just COVID, was 40 higher than the five-year average for the same time of year. However, as we've seen in recent weeks, that figure does fluctuate. Uh, Public Health Scotland have also today published a new report providing more detailed analysis of the causes of excess deaths during the pandemic. Uh, let me now very briefly give an update on the main clusters uh, that we have been dealing with in recent days. Firstly, the outbreak linked to the Two Sisters food processing plant in Cooperangus. As of yesterday, there were 156 positive cases linked to that cluster. That's 138 workers of the factory and 18 of their contacts. Uh, that's a rise of four um, on uh, the previous figure and all four new cases are workers in the factory. Almost all of the workers at the factory have now been tested. In total, more than 5,000 people have been tested in Tayside over the past seven days. Uh, that's good progress, and I want to thank everyone who's working hard to manage this outbreak. Uh, so far, the testing has not revealed a large number of positive cases amongst contacts of the workforce. And let me stress, there is still no evidence at this stage of wider community transmission. That said, contact tracing and testing is still ongoing. Uh, workers at the factory and their households should continue to self-isolate until Monday 31st August. And I want to emphasise that that restriction applies even if any of those individuals have received a negative test. Uh, let me also give a quick update on the situation at Kings Park School in Dundee. In total, 31 cases have been identified as part of that cluster. Two of those uh, 31 cases are pupils at the school. Um, all school staff, pupils and household contacts of pupils have been given advice on self-isolation, as have other relevant contacts. In addition, testing has been undertaken for all staff who work at the school and testing is available for children who have been identified as close contacts. And finally, in relation to the outbreak in Aberdeen, there are 261 cases now associated with the cluster linked to pubs, uh, and that figure is unchanged from yesterday. And the total number of cases in Grampian as a whole over the past month is 435. Hospitality in Aberdeen is due to reopen from today. In preparation for that, Aberdeen City Council has been carrying out environmental health checks at premises across the city. I'm very grateful for these efforts and I want to thank everyone in Aberdeen for complying so well with these restrictions. Uh, these clusters remind us again how easily COVID can spread if we give it the opportunity. So all of us need to continue to play our part in keeping the virus under control. Amongst other things, that means following the restrictions on household and social gatherings. And more broadly, of course, it means following the five rules of the Facts Campaign. And I'll 
conclude with a reminder of what they are. Face coverings in enclosed spaces, uh, avoiding crowded places, cleaning hands and hard surfaces regularly, uh, two metres distancing as the overall rule and uh, self-isolation and book a test if you have any symptoms. If all of us follow these rules, uh, we can continue, I hope, to uh, drive down this virus, protect ourselves, our loved ones and the wider community. So my thanks again to everybody who is helping us do exactly that. Thank you, First Minister. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. I would remind members we're going to take all the supplementaries uh, aft, at the end after question eight. However, you can press your button if you wish a supplementary at any point, in fact, as soon as possible. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to return to the subject of care homes, as there were some questions last week that didn't receive a satisfactory answer, including who knew what and when. So let me ask again. When was the First Minister first informed that COVID-positive patients had been transferred into care homes? Was she first told in March, April, May, June, July or August? First Minister. We are still, as I reported last week, uh, awaiting the analysis from Public Health Scotland of uh, the numbers of people who were uh, discharged from hospital into care homes who uh, may have uh, had the virus uh, and whether or not they had been tested and what the circumstances are. We will make that available uh, fully and uh, we'll do that as soon as it is available. Uh, let me turn again to the position that I set out clearly uh, last week. Uh, ministers set the policy, the guidance uh, was clear from uh, the 13th of March about the need to clinically assess uh, patients being discharged from hospital before uh, being admitted to care homes. Uh, I, nor any other minister, would expect to know the individual details uh, of the clinical risk assessment undertaken uh, in respect of any particular patient. Uh, of course, uh, ministers uh, were clear, indeed we made clear to this parliament, uh, that it was our objective, uh, as it has been our objective for many years, to reduce the numbers of people uh, in delayed discharge uh, circumstances in uh, our hospitals. Uh, we set an initial target of doing that by 400. We then said that we had exceeded uh, that target. So ministers have been very clear about the policy objectives we had set. We've been very clear about the guidance that has been put in place. Uh, but ministers uh, in this government, and I'm pretty sure this will have been the case in uh, previous governments and indeed in other governments across the UK, are not party uh, to the clinical risk assessments that are done in the case of individual patients. Ruth Davison. We'll get onto the policy objective in a minute, but that's the fourth time that question has been asked at First Minister's Questions. Twice by me last week, once by Richard Leonard, once by me again today, and that's the fourth time that the First Minister has ducked the answer. And what I can't work out is why. Because the First Minister keeps saying that this government will be open about its mistakes, and putting people with COVID into care homes was clearly a mistake, and part of fixing mistakes is working out who knew what and when. So either this happened, and the government knew that it had happened and it informed their later decision making, or it happened without the government knowing. And they only found out, like the rest of us, through a newspaper report last week. So which is it? First Minister. Ruth Davidson has asked the question, and I am answering the question, I do not know the clinical conditions of patients who are being discharged from hospital to their own homes, uh, to, the community, to, to other community settings, or to care homes. That would not be information uh, that ministers would have. Uh, what we have asked to do, and let me, uh, as I think I'm correct in saying here, point out we're the only government in the UK so far to have done this. Uh, we have asked Public Health Scotland uh, to look in detail um, at the situation with patients uh, being discharged from hospital to care home, what the situation was uh, in terms of whether they may or uh, may not have been positive with COVID uh, and whether they had been tested and if not, what the rationale for that was. And when we have that information, we will uh, transparently and fully make that available to Parliament and I'm sure we will have further exchanges on it. Uh, what it is the responsibility of government to do is to set the guidance and the guidance uh, was issued, the first guidance uh, around uh, COVID was issued to care homes on the 13th of March and uh, I think uh, we have uh, talked about the contents of that before, that guidance was updated as appropriate um, and of course we very openly and very transparently set um, an objective around reducing delayed discharge. And it's interesting to me that uh, opposition politicians 
are now uh, trying to suggest that they didn't know that was the case. Firstly, because we set it out to Parliament. The Health Secretary set it out on the 17th of March. I talked about it on the 1st of April. The Health Secretary again in Parliament on the 1st of April. And on the 10th of March, Miles Briggs uh, from the Conservatives uh, asked uh, in this Parliament what progress has been made in the past week to increase bed capacity in every NHS hospital across Scotland. Um, on the 1st of April, Jamie Green from the Conservatives uh, said evidence suggests that many people who are ready to leave hospital are still stuck in hospital settings. I therefore ask the First Minister how many people are currently stuck in a hospital setting and what is she doing in order to make sure uh, that that is addressed. So the policy was clear. Um, and we will continue to provide as much detail around how that policy was implemented uh, as we can. Um, and we will do that as soon as Public Health Scotland has completed the analysis we have asked it to do. Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, I'm very well aware that in individual discharges are clinical decisions. What I don't understand is why the First Minister won't answer when she was first informed that it had occurred. But perhaps let's, we should recap on what's changed from last week asking the same questions to this. We've learned that NHS Scotland wrote to health boards on March the 6th, more than two weeks before lockdown, to tell them to move patients out of hospital. We know that a target was made to move 900 patients out of hospital by the end of April. And we've learned that by early April, the health secretary congratulated health boards on their tremendous progress in doing so. So we've learned, despite the First Minister's previous protestations, change today, that the government were driving this policy, yet it appears we're also supposed to believe that the government knew nothing about how this policy was being achieved and wasn't aware of the decision to move COVID-positive patients into care homes. Is that really credible? First Minister. Look, I have to say to Ruth Davidson, if it is the case that she only learned about this policy in the past couple of weeks, then I think that raises more questions about Ruth Davidson's attention to the situation than it does about anything else. Uh, let me, on, on the 17th of March, the Health Secretary stood up in this uh, Parliament and she said, and I am quoting now, uh, I have set a goal of reducing uh, delayed discharges by at least 400 by the end of this month. On the 1st of April, um, I stood up in this parliament and I said the target that we set at the start of the month of quickly reducing delayed discharge cases by 400 has already been met and we are now working to go further. On the 1st of April, uh, the Health Secretary also repeated that. On the 10th of March, Miles Briggs demanded to know what progress we had made in increasing bed capacity. So if the Conservatives did not know that that was the policy objective and for years opposition politicians have rightly been pressuring government to reduce delayed discharge, but if they didn't know we were trying to do that eh, for the additional objective of freeing up hospital capacity because of what we thought was about to happen to our hospitals, then I just have to wonder where were they and what were they paying attention to because it wasn't what was going on with COVID. Ruth Davison. The First Minister is clearly irked by this line of questioning, but we've spoken to a number of families who have been affected by this, and they want to know how, when and how many COVID patients were put into the care homes in which their loved ones died. A presiding officer, nearly 2,000 people have died in Scottish care homes throughout this crisis. Now, we've called for the public inquiry into care homes to start immediately because it's not right, nor is it fair on families, to have information emerge bit by bit piece by piece. They deserve answers now. And it shouldn't be left to freedom of information requests, and it shouldn't be left to newspaper investigations to find out what happened here, one piece of correspondence at a time. If the First Minister will not start the public inquiry now, and she said that she won't, will she at least commit today to publish all of the correspondence between herself, the Health Secretary, NHS boards and care homes throughout this pandemic to give families the clarity that they deserve. First Minister. I'm, I'm happy to make any relevant information available, but I'm going further than that. I, I am going further than that. The Health Secretary has already set out, because I happen to agree that it is right that families 
have answers to any questions that they have. That is why this government, unlike our counterparts, as far as I am aware, um, in any of the other governments in the UK, have asked Public Health Scotland to look specifically at these questions, to look at patients that were discharged from, care, from hospitals to care homes, to look at whether they were tested, if they weren't tested, why not, um, and if they had uh, COVID. That uh, exercise we have asked to be complete by the end of September, and we will publish that in full. That is a level of transparency around this that has not been replicated or matched anywhere else in the UK. The Health Secretary has actually uh, written to other governments in, in the UK suggesting that they do likewise so that we've got the picture um, in all four nations. But we will have it here um, and when that is available uh, these questions can not just be answered but they can be scrutinised uh, by the opposition. So we're going about this in the right way. Of course as we do that we are also continuing to focus on making sure we have uh, the right policies and procedures in place because it is not the case uh, to say that they weren't in place. Uh, we have had guidance in place for care homes, uh, which uh, involved the requirement for risk assessment to be done for patients. Uh, we have had guidance in place around infection prevention and control in care homes. These are the appropriate things that we should have uh, done, and we will continue to ensure that that is subject to scrutiny and transparency as we learn lessons and continue to navigate our way through this pandemic. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, today's government expenditure and revenue Scotland figures show that Scotland has a fiscal deficit of £15 billion and rising. But the figures also show how much we need active government and how much it can do. It shows the value of tax-funded public services and the value of redistribution according to need. Scottish Labour's greatest concern is ensuring that those who are in need get the support when they need it. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the value of solidarity and the value of working together. That's why we are calling on the UK government to extend the job retention scheme beyond October to save businesses and jobs. That's why we are calling on the Scottish government to deliver a quality jobs guarantee scheme. And it's why we are calling on both governments to cooperate, to work together to deliver job retention and job creation. So can I ask the First Minister again, will she join with us to pressure the UK government to extend the job retention scheme? And will she commit to a quality Scottish job guarantee scheme delivering secure jobs based on the principles of fair work? And will she do it before the end of October? First Minister. Um, again, I don't know where Richard Leonard has been for the last few weeks. I've been asking the UK government to continue the furlough job retention scheme almost every day for weeks. So I'm, I'm glad that Richard Leonard has now decided to back that call. Uh, in addition to that, the Scottish Government has also set out plans uh, for a youth jobs uh, guarantee scheme, and we'll set out more detail of that in the coming uh, days and weeks. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, Richard Leonard um, is capable of, of still surprising in, in this chamber, because I didn't think it would be him today that stood up to extol the virtues of Scotland being governed by a Conservative Westminster government. I thought that might come from the other side of the chamber. You know, the thing is, the, the furlough scheme, the furlough scheme um, is funded uh, by the UK government borrowing money. And the reason that they borrow that money and do it for us is because we don't have the powers here to do it ourselves. And what I would say to Richard Leonard is this, just use your imagination, right? And imagine Scotland was independent right now. He wouldn't have to be asking me to plead with a UK government to borrow more money to extend the job retention scheme. We could do it ourselves here in Scotland, like other independent countries the world over. And you know, it's probably that conclusion that has led to the situation we have right now, where what almost a half of Richard Leonard's remaining Labour supporters, a dwindling band of people, I grant you, but almost a half of them now support Scotland becoming an independent country. Richard Leonard. Well, the First Minister will need to answer the question about where she is going to make up that £15 billion deficit and where she is going to find, and, and where she is going to find the £100 billion it will take 
to set up the separate Scottish currency that she now says she wants. This public health and economic crisis is the greatest challenge that the Scottish Parliament has faced during its lifetime. And it is time for all political parties in this Parliament to focus on and do what this Parliament was set up to do. So the First Minister must set out how her government will use all of the powers of this Parliament in next week's programme for government, because all our attention now and in the foreseeable future needs to be on jobs, on reshaping the economy, investing in public services, building back better and tackling poverty and inequalities. And let me give just one example. People are anxious. People are anxious about losing their homes as more and more people are anxious about losing their jobs and those anxieties will rise. So unless the First Minister uses her powers, intervenes, more and more people will lose their homes. So will the First Minister commit today to use this Parliament's powers to ban evictions until the next Parliament? And will she ensure that this time it is a ban and not simply a delay? First Minister. We've already, I think I did it last week or it might have been the week before, um, but I've already stood here and said that we will extend the protection against evictions in the original coronavirus uh, legislation for an additional uh, six months. So, you know, again, Richard Leonard really needs to keep up with announcements uh, as they are made by this government. I'm afraid I, I don't have the luxury of going at his pace on these things, we have to power ahead and get these things completed. Can I say to Richard Leonard, I will, in the programme for government, in the budgets that come, we will use our powers and our resources uh, to the fullest effect possible. But if we had the powers and the resources uh, that other independent countries right now have at their disposal, we wouldn't be in the position uh, of facing, what are the two biggest threats to Scotland's jobs right now. Firstly, it's the withdrawal of the jobs retention scheme. If we were independent, we wouldn't have to be going cap in hand to the UK government pleading with them to continue it. We could do it ourselves. The other big threat is a no deal Brexit at the end of this year. If we were independent, we wouldn't have to face that prospect either. And can I say to Richard Leonard, you know, really aping the Tories on using JERS, which is a reflection of Scotland's fiscal position within the United Kingdom, not a reflection of how Scotland would fare as an independent country. But talking about deficits at a time when the UK deficit is projected at next year to be almost £400 billion, and at a time when the UK debt has just topped £2 trillion, pounds is not the strongest territory for the Tories to be on, but it seems like politically suicidal territory for Labour to be on. Richard Leonard. Well, well Scottish deficit is around 9% of GDP. The UK is less than 3% of GDP. So there is a comparison to make that anybody reasonable and rational would want to make. But let me, let me, let me talk to something else which the First Minister spoke about, which is about powering ahead. Well, let's talk about powering ahead on the question of child poverty. Because today, both the Children's Commissioner and the Chair of the Poverty and Inequality Commission have united to call on the First Minister to bring forward, not to delay, but to bring forward an equivalent of the Scottish Child Payment. In a joint plea to the First Minister, they argue, and I quote them, Women have been particularly hard hit by the economic storm that has engulfed us, with women's poverty being inextricably linked to child poverty. They go on to say, without this urgent Scottish Government action, the colder months will bring the cold blasts of economic hardship, with families facing even greater struggle before the Scottish child payment begins its rollout. The Scottish Government has said, that COVID makes this difficult, but COVID is what makes it urgent. If it's possible to rapidly introduce payments to businesses in need, surely it's possible to rapidly introduce payments to families and children in need. So First Minister, will you get the cash to the families who need it now? First Minister. Scotland is about to become the only country in the UK that has a Scottish child payment. 
Um, we will start to take applications for that in November this year, and the first payments will be made at the start of next year. No other government in the UK, including the Welsh Labour government, is getting anywhere near doing what we are doing to deliver what has been described by poverty campaigners as a game changer on child poverty. That's what we are doing within our powers. And yes, because of the systems that have to be put in place to practically deliver that, that is the quickest timetable on which we can do that, given the COVID challenges. But criticising us for taking a couple of months uh, to start to have applications open, when his own colleagues in Wales are not doing it at all, seems to me to be rather a hypocritical stance for Richard Leonard to take. But again, I come back to this point. If Richard Leonard started to really think about what the real drive of child poverty are right now, he would stop being Boris Johnson's chief cheerleader in this parliament and actually start standing up for this parliament having the powers we need. It is welfare policies. It's the austerity politics of Westminster governments that have driven more children into poverty. We are doing what we can to lift them out, but as long as powers lie with Westminster and not in this parliament, we will be doing it with one hand tied behind our back. And I suspect, to come back to an earlier point, that is why more and more uh, of the dwindling band of Labour voters in this country now see that independence would be a better future for Scotland. The sooner Richard Leonard wakes up to that and stops defending continued Tory governments taking decisions about Scotland, the better for all of us and probably the better for his own party. Question number three, Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure members will join me in expressing sadness and outrage at the tragic death of Mercy Baguma. On Saturday, Mercy was found dead beside her malnourished baby in a Glasgow flat. Thankfully, her child has now been released from hospital. This appalling tragedy occurred as a direct, as a direct result of UK government asylum policy, which forced Mercy into extreme poverty. We cannot allow mothers and babies to go hungry in 21st century Scotland. I know that the Home Office is responsible in this case and the Home Secretary must answer for this entirely preventable death. But we cannot simply stand by. This is on all of us. So what will the First Minister do to ensure that this tragedy isn't repeated? And is she able to advise whether the Lord Advocate is initiating an inquiry into this incident? First I, I cannot speak for the Lord Advocate, as Alison Johnson knows, uh, on issues of, of death inquiry, um, but I'm sure he would be uh, perfectly willing to uh, correspond with Alison Johnson on that. But I'm, I'm grateful, uh, although I don't know that that's the right word to Alison Johnson for raising this issue today. Like probably most people across this country, I find myself consumed with, with sadness, but also with real anger at the, the death of Mercy Baguma. And first and foremost, my thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of all of us go to her uh, family and friends uh, following her tragic death. The exact circumstances of her death are not yet known, and I think it's important to be clear about that. I certainly would support all and any efforts to establish the facts of this tragic case. Uh, but what I think we can all say, um, and we knew this, I think, before this tragedy, but it is underlined by this tragedy, that the UK asylum system is not just broken, it is deeply inhumane and it must be changed. Uh, people who come to Scotland because they need a place of safety should have our support um, and that is even more true right now at this time of crisis. Asylum is wholly reserved to the UK government and that includes the procurement and the operation of asylum accommodation and the support contracts. Uh, the Community Secretary and indeed this government as a whole has repeatedly raised our concerns with the Home Office about accommodation and support for asylum seekers um, both before and during the pandemic and we will continue to do so. Uh, but we need wholesale reform of our asylum system and we need to start from the principle uh, of dignity, of empathy and of support for our fellow human beings who come to this country seeking support at uh, desperate and dismal times of their lives and I would appeal to the UK government to look into their hearts as a result of this case and finally make the changes that are needed. Alison Johnson. Thank you. I agree with the First Minister that wholesale reform is required. In response to this tragedy, the Home Office has said that it takes the well-being of all those in the asylum system extremely seriously. Now, anyone who sees the cruel way asylum seekers are treated knows that statement simply isn't credible. 
This is the third death of an asylum seeker in Scotland in recent months. So can I ask if the First Minister will write to the Home Secretary to demand an independent inquiry into the deaths and suffering caused by the UK's hostile environment? Can I ask whether the First Minister supports the call from positive action in housing for an inquiry into the housing of asylum seekers during the pandemic? And if the First Minister supports the Scottish Greens campaign for, for asylum accommodation to be taken out of private hands and managed at a local level with the support of the third sector, what specific actions is the Scottish Government taking now to deliver this change? Thank you. First Minister. Um, I, I think I support pretty much everything Alison Johnson has said there. I am very happy uh, for the Scottish Government to raise uh, the issue of an inquiry with the Home Office. We have repeatedly raised these concerns with the Home Office. And I, I don't want to um, politicise uh, this, but it is, I'm afraid, another issue where we need to stop having to plead with a UK government uh, to change the way they do things and actually have the ability in this parliament to put in place the systems that we think reflect our values uh, as a country. Um, I also do support uh, positive action in housing's uh, call for an inquiry and, and we will look to see what we can do to give practical uh, support to that. Um, and I, I don't know all of the details of the Green campaign, I'm very happy to look at it, but it sounds as if it is something that yes, we would support and would be happy again to look at uh, the, the practical steps we can take uh, to uh, turn that support into action. Uh, what I would say, uh, and I said it before, is that the uh, fact that asylum is wholly reserved to the UK government uh, includes the procurement and operation of asylum accommodation. Uh, so there are real constraints here about what the Scottish Government can do in these circumstances, which is why uh, over the, the longer term, um, I do want to see a situation where we have more control of these decisions here in our own parliament. It, you know, when we have control of these kinds of decisions, it's not the case that we will get everything right all of the time, uh, but we will be able to have systems that reflect our values as a country. And I think what happened to Mercy Baguma, um, although we don't know all of the details of that, but I think all of the hallmarks of the UK's asylum system right now, I don't believe reflect the values of the Scotland I know and love. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Yeah, I share the grief felt by others on the tragic death of Mercy Bakuma, and I agree that we must have the answers. We deserve that. Um, intelligent young people from all over the world come to Scotland because of our brilliant universities, and we have a duty to keep them safe when they are here. Yesterday, we heard about 11 new virus test centres, including one in St Andrews, which will be welcomed by locals, visitors and students. What we didn't hear was a new policy on testing international students. Can the First Minister update the Chamber? First Minister. Uh, we will publish revised guidance for colleges, universities and student accommodation, uh, reflecting the most up-to-date scientific advice um, by next Tuesday, the 1st of September. We are still finalising uh, some of the details of that, including around testing. Um, and uh, as I say, we will publish that uh, by uh, Tuesday next week. Um, I do believe testing has an important part to play here in how we uh, protect uh, the stu student community and, of course, wider communities where student populations are based. The uh, new walk-in testing centre in St Andrews that I referred to yesterday will be a an important part of that. We are also There will be further walk-in test centres across the country uh, established between now and October, and uh, one of the priorities for those is to look at locations that support student uh, populations. But I appreciate Willie Rennie has raised this uh, on a number of occasions, we are looking very carefully at all of the details of the different steps, not just testing that we have to take, and detail will be published early next week. Willie Ray? I think that is good news, but I'm sure the First Minister will understand my frustration at this. It has been a month since Devi Shridhar, her own advisor, recommended that all international students should be tested on day one and day five, and I've been asking almost every week since. Yet we must wait even longer for the policy. Students are arriving for the new term right now. It will be the biggest movement of people since the lockdown, and I think we've all got a duty to keep them safe. We know that there is a rise in cases in Italy because of young people returning from holiday. Germany and France are insisting on tests for all travellers from hotspot countries, including students. So can I have some answers now, if it's at all possible? Will all students be asked to get a test when they arrive in the country and on day five? When will the testing capacity be ready and will it be a condition of their studies? Minister. 
We'll set out the detail on the testing policy when we publish the updated guidance. I'm not going to uh, give the, the specific detail on that because I want to make sure that we are uh, properly finalising that and taking the decisions that we think are right, uh, that are based on the best uh, advice and also uh, that we have the, the delivery mechanisms in place. I do want to be clear, though, um, that while we are uh, finalising updated guidance that will be published this week, there are already arrangements in place that universities and colleges are working to deliver. So blended learning, which will be uh, a deliberate effort to reduce numbers on campus. There are arrangements about enhanced cleaning and hygiene measures, uh, two metres physical distancing, and of course, uh, staff and students who are arriving here from certain countries, high-risk countries, will have uh, an obligation to quarantine for 14 days, which is a really important foundation, whatever uh, the final position is on uh, testing. And there's also a process of familiarising uh, students with health protection measures uh, and making sure that that is embedded in student induction. So there, are, there is already a, a considerable amount of work ongoing to ensure that students are safe and wider communities are safe. Uh, and the guidance that we will publish next week is an update on that and will cover whether there are additional steps that we intend to take. Thank you. Question number five, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is preparing for any spikes in COVID-19 infections over the winter period. First Minister. Uh, we are working closely with health boards, uh, other partners and uh, the wider public sector to manage and plan for uh, a potential resurgence of COVID-19 alongside our usual winter planning and, of course, the remobilisation of paused services. Uh, as part of this approach, we are implementing a revised testing strategy, which was uh, published, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have put in place robust outbreak management arrangements. We are replenishing key equipment and PPE stockpiles. And, of course, we are planning an expansion of the seasonal flu vaccination programme. NHS boards have prepared their remobilisation plans to March 2021, which incorporate arrangements for potential uh, surges in COVID over winter, and we're currently reviewing these. Uh, and finally, as part of a broader assessment of our preparedness, uh, Professor Sir Harry Burns, our former Chief Medical Officer, is making recommendations in relation to winter preparedness. Gillian Martin. Thank the First Minister for that answer. The Scottish Government, of course, is in charge of health and social care and has demonstrated control over a range of policy issues that have equipped us to manage the effects of the pandemic since March. However, the gaps in the powers of the Scottish Government have been exposed, particularly in the economic and financial response. What is the First Minister doing now to ensure that if we are in the unfortunate situation where further lockdowns are needed to control any spikes in infection, that we have the powers to provide financial resilience for workers and businesses, particularly if the UK Government ceases programmes that they funded through their borrowing powers? First Minister. Well, we've already taken a wide range in action to support businesses and workers since the start of the pandemic, including the £2.3 billion uh, worth of business support. Uh, and we'll continue to work very closely with businesses and with local authorities uh, in the event of any local restrictions. We launched a support fund for local businesses affected by the measures introduced to contain the outbreak in Aberdeen. Of course, as I've uh, just uh, said in my exchange with Richard Leonard, we don't have the borrowing powers to replicate a furlough scheme in Scotland. That requires action from the UK Government. Uh, so we're keen to work with them to ensure that any extended or replacement scheme, which we hope there will be, meets the needs of businesses and workers here in Scotland. The Economy Secretary wrote again on Friday to UK ministers asking uh, that the furlough scheme be extended to provide support in areas where we know it will be needed beyond the 31st of October, such as support for businesses and workers if local lockdown restrictions are put in place. Question number six, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to Police Scotland figures suggesting that reports of abuse against disabled people almost doubled during lockdown. First Minister. Uh, nobody should ever face abuse because they have a disability or impairment. Uh, and I'm very clear that any form of hate crime, including abuse or prejudice, is totally unacceptable and must not be tolerated. Uh, the government takes these matters very seriously. Uh, we've met with key organisations throughout the pandemic to listen to concerns directly from disabled people and recognise the damaging effects that abuse and hate crime has on victims, their families and communities. Uh, and I think all of us have a responsibility to challenge it. We also continue to work uh, closely with Police Scotland and partners to tackle hate crime, including developing campaign activity to raise awareness and encourage reporting. And I would strongly encourage anyone who has experienced or witnessed any such abuse or any hate crime to report it to the police. 
Rachel Hamilton. Thank the First Minister for that answer. The population is concerned about the risk of contracting coronavirus and rules about social distancing have helped reduce the spread of the virus. However, these rules are inherently visual and almost impossible for blind and partially sighted people in Scotland, two thirds of whom stated in RNB, RNIB uh, research that they feel less independent now compared to before lockdown because of the abuse they receive on a daily basis as they struggle to cope with getting out and about and with physical distancing. Some individuals have been shouted and spat on and in a recent journalist, uh, Ian Hamilton, said he feels more blind now than he did before COVID. First Minister, attitudes must change. Can I ask that the Scottish Government commit to a public awareness campaign to highlight these issues and ensure that public messages are underpinned by the reflection of how challenging physical distances is for disabled people. First Minister. Uh, yeah, I will certainly uh, consider that uh, suggestion. I think it is really important that we take every opportunity to raise awareness about the, the challenges, particularly during the pandemic, uh, that people with disabilities face and the complete unacceptability of any abuse, uh, discrimination, hate crime or, or stigma. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, we provided funding to the British Deaf Association, Deaf Blind Scotland and the Glasgow Disability Alliance, uh, which paid for key public health messages to be produced in British Sign Language, Braille uh, and Easy Read. Um, and uh, Glasgow Disability Alliance, I know, used some of that funding uh, to help disabled people connect to the internet to keep up with guidance. This is uh, a really difficult time for everybody, but I do uh, agree that it is more difficult for people uh, who have disabilities for all of the reasons that have been set out. Um, so we'll consider uh, all possible ways of uh, helping them uh, deal with these challenges, but fundamentally uh, making sure that we continue to challenge prejudice, abuse or discrimination in all its forms. Thank you. Question seven, James Kelly. To ask the Scottish Government uh, what action is taken to address concerns that the hate crime and public order bill Scotland is an attack on free speech? First Minister. Well, I, I think we've just heard uh, an illustration of why it's really important that we do tackle hate crime in all and any form. Uh, the bill proposals uh, seek to find a balance between protecting those who do suffer from uh, the scourge of hate crime while also respecting uh, people's freedom of speech and expression, which is extremely important. And the bill approaches this through the prism of the European Convention on Human Rights. We know that hate crime is damaging um, and disruptive. We just heard that it is rooted in prejudice and intolerance. Uh, and as the Justice Secretary made clear in the Chamber last week, the Scottish Government will engage, uh, listen and seek to find common ground to help ensure the bill protects people from hate crime, which I hope everybody will agree is important while respecting freedom of speech and expression. James Kelly. Action on hate crime is welcome and important. However, it is clear that there is a serious problem with the stirring up hatred defence uh, as proposed in the legislation. The Law Society, the Police Federation, the Catholic Church and a range of stakeholders have lined up to criticise the vague language in the bill and express concerns that it's a threat to freedom of speech. Does the First Minister accept that the government have got its approach to this legislation badly wrong and the stirring up hatred offence needs to be deleted in full or amended heavily? First Minister. Um, no, I, I don't accept that. What I do accept, and, and I hope everybody will enter into the legislative process here in the same spirit, we have to uh, consider these things, we have to listen to views that are expressed, and we have to decide whether amendments are required to the bill. That is the right way to go about this, and I would suggest that nobody should go into this process with a closed mind, and, and that includes opposition members just as much as it includes uh, the Scottish Government. Um, I, I hear the concerns that have been expressed, and the, the Government will consider all of them carefully. Uh, that said, the concept of stirring up hatred offences is not new to Scots law. Uh, there have been long-standing stirring up racial hatred offences uh, operating effectively in Scotland since, uh, I think, the mid 1980s. The bill also includes explicit provisions on freedom of expression um, and the bill's provisions are required to be interpreted in accordance with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so, you know, I, I do think it is important that people 
um, express their views uh, on this or any bill at the start of a legislative process, uh, that we try to do that constructively. Um, the government has a, a duty to listen and we will listen and we will respond appropriately. But let's not uh, lose sight of what we were talking about in the previous question. Hate crime is a real uh, problem in Scotland and all of us have a duty to tackle it. And uh, that is wider than legal ways of tackling it, but it certainly it has to include that. Thank you. Joining us remotely for question eight, Mark Ruskell. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister whether adequate measures are in place in Scotland's university towns to prevent local COVID-19 outbreaks as students begin to return to campuses. First Minister. Um, I've obviously just covered some of uh, this uh, content in my exchange with Willie Rennie, but colleges and universities are already working to ensure a safe environment for students as they return and uh, this currently includes blended learning to reduce numbers on campus, enhanced cleaning and hygiene measures, two metres physical distancing, quarantine for staff and students arriving from certain countries and familiarisation with health protection measures embedded in student induction. Uh, however, as I covered earlier on, revised guidance for colleges, universities and student accommodation that reflects the most up-to-date scientific advice will be published uh, by Tuesday the 1st of September. Mark Russell. Last week, I met with members of the St Andrews University and College Union who are deeply concerned about a decision by the university to make in-person teaching the default. Over 9,000 students from around the world are returning to the town from this week. The university have said that only the largest lectures will move online. That's clearly not blended learning, First Minister. Staff at Edinburgh University have reported similar concerns Yet Glasgow and UHI have said in-person teaching will not resume this calendar year. So will the revision of the Scottish Government guidance ensure that all universities adopt the safest approach possible? And can the First Minister confirm if universities pushing staff to deliver in-person teaching is consistent with the Government's route map, which says that people should continue to work from home by default? First Minister. I don't think staff in any uh, sector of the economy should be put under uh, pressure to do things that we uh, are not advising, um, and that is a, a, a general comment. Um, obviously, uh, we are very clear on the need for a, a form of blended learning. Different institutions will take different decisions based on their circumstances, and I think that is right and proper, uh, but they must, all of them, have uh, regard and very serious regard uh, to how they keep their student communities safe, the, the staff who work in their institutions, but also how they uh, make sure that their arrangements don't pose a risk to the wider communities that they're located in as well. Uh, that's why the arrangements that I have set out are important, uh, but that uh, we are also taking, uh, going through a process of uh, assessing that guidance in the light of the most up-to-date advice. And as I, I've said a number of times now today, we will publish the updated guidance uh, by next Tuesday. Thank you. We have a fair number of uh, members wish to ask supplementaries. The first from Ruth Maguire, to be followed by Brian Whittle. Ruth Maguire. Presiding officer, GSK have announced that around 60 jobs are set to be lost from the Irvine plant by the end of this year. At any time, this would be bitterly disappointing, but in the current climate, will feel even more devastating to those involved and our wider community. Um, I ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government can give to workers and whether sector-specific or indeed area-specific support will be available to ensure that important life science jobs are retained in Ayrshire. First Minister. Uh, well, like Ruth McGuire, I'm disappointed uh, to learn that GSK is in consultation with its workforce in Irvine with a view to making a number of redundancies. Uh, this will obviously be an anxious time for those affected, particularly during the current situation. Uh, Scottish Enterprise will continue to engage with the company throughout the consultation period to explore all possible options to support the business and its workforce. Uh, GSK sites in Scotland are very important to the company's global pharmaceutical supply network and they are an important partner in Scotland's life sciences community. Uh, should there be uh, job losses, and we will explore every opportunity to avoid that, uh, but should there be job losses, we will provide support through the partnership Action for Continuing Employment, the PACE initiative, uh, through providing skills development and employability support, PACE aims to minimise the time any individual affected by redundancy is out of work. And I know the Economy Secretary would be very happy to uh, continue to update the member um, on this situation as it develops. Brian Whittle, to be followed by Rhoda Grant. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I was contacted by a constituent yesterday whose child was sent home from school with uh, a blocked nose, uh, uh, streaming eyes and uh, a, a chesty cough. In other words, it sounds very much like a cold. The school were fine, but when parents found out that uh, that child had been sent home, there was pressure put on that constituent to have that child tested for COVID. The influence being, if that child came back to school, they wouldn't allow their children back into school without a test. The parent has eventually gone and got that test done because they were worried how that child would be treated when they go back into school. So if that, if that, is, that, that kind of behaviour is reflective of what will happen across winter when half the children in a school end up with the sniffles, that is inevitably going to overwhelm the testing process and lead to the exact thing we're trying to stop, which is the spread of COVID. Can I ask the First Minister and the Scottish Government how we can make sure that the message gets out that, uh, uh, that, that COVID symptoms are not a common cold? First question. Um, so, uh, as we've always said, as we go into winter and there are other circulating viruses, the demand for testing will inevitably increase, which is why we are further increasing the capacity. We've had a significant demand for testing this week, I think obviously a, a, a consequence of children being back at school, uh, and we are activating contingency plans to increase capacity this week, and we've got further medium to long-term plans uh, for the, the permanent increase in capacity. I think it's really important to be clear uh, that when anybody, including a child, has one of the symptoms of COVID, and one of the symptoms of COVID is a, a, a new continuous cough, then they should be going to be tested for COVID. That is the very clear advice we're giving. So anybody who has a, a new cough uh, or a fever or a loss of or change in their sense of taste or smell should be booking a test. Um, if a child doesn't have any of those symptoms, uh, but just has a, a, a blocked up nose, for example, then clearly that's not one of the symptoms and therefore there is no requirement to get tested. But a cough is uh, one of, of the symptoms. In terms of the implications for other children in schools, uh, test and protect will operate and local health protection teams will operate on the basis uh, of advising parents where any child uh, has tested positive and therefore there is a requirement for other children to isolate because they have been close contacts and I would advise parents uh, to uh, follow that advice um, and if they're not getting that advice then there is, is no need to keep children without symptoms out of school but it's important to be very clear for all of us to be very clear what the symptoms are where we do advise a test and where other symptoms that may be indicative of other illnesses where we don't uh, require a test. But we've got to all be very careful not to inadvertently muddy the waters of that. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On 17th June, I raised the issue of collection of home testing kits at First Minister's questions. A constituent had not been able to return his test within 72 hours and it was therefore rendered useless. I've now had a letter from the Cabinet Secretary for Health saying, I'm aware that in some remote areas, home testing kits are not available because of difficulties in the delivery of kits in a timely manner. She went on to say that current locations for mobile testing units in Oban, Dornoch, Fort William, Ullapoke, and you see Thurso, Portree, Campbelltown, and Loch Gilped are available until the end of August. Therefore, home testing is not available to many of my constituents and mobile, mobile testing will only be available until the end of August. This is simply wrong. Can I ask the First Minister what she's going to do to ensure that all my constituents have access to COVID-19 testing, regardless of where they live? First Minister. Uh, we are uh, making sure that people have access to testing. Um, the home testing kits are delivered through the, the UK government uh, system um, and there are issues with uh, sometimes longer delivery times in remote areas which is why we are also increasing the number of mobile units that are available. Now mobile units by their very nature will uh, move to different locations around the country based on demand and, and based on need but we are uh, going to see a further so this week in terms of some of the contingency that we've brought to bear there's three additional mobile units being uh, allocated albeit across the central belt because of the demand patterns, uh, but we are increasing the number of mobile units over uh, the period as we lead into winter. But also the initial uh, 11 uh, walk-in centres, we will be looking very carefully at the locations of those and there will be further walk-in centres uh, as we, we go beyond that as well. So we are looking carefully at patterns of demand, but also at geographical uh, issues uh, because we want to make testing 
uh, quickly available to people and uh, the testing turnaround times right now are uh, for, in the main uh, within the, the time scales that we would seek but we also want to continue to make it more accessible for people um, so that they don't have to travel uh, inordinate distances in order to access that so uh, local access and geographical access is very much a priority as we continue to expand the system. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. It's been well documented this week about the online problems of the UK government's COVID-19 testing portal between applicants, including my constituents, either been sent to Argyll or even Northern Ireland for a test, or the system itself not taking the application. But what engagement has the Scottish Government undertaken with the UK Government to fix this online portal, which is so important to aid my constituents and also those across Scotland to get the tests that they need? First Minister. So th this week we've had, a, a, I think, if I can uh, characterise it this way, probably three challenges with, with testing, which, we're, uh, which will interrelate in some way. So we have had some technical problems through the UK government uh, booking system, which we are uh, working with the Department of Health uh, and Social Care in England to uh, resolve. And, and that includes uh, situations where people in Scotland uh, are being uh, referred to uh, testing centres that are uh, a long way away from them and sometimes outside of Scotland and we, we hope that issue will be resolved. We've also had, uh, yesterday we had a, a weather related problem, the uh, regional testing centre in Edinburgh for example had to close because of high winds which hopefully will uh, be resolved quickly. The more fundamental issue uh, which is one we've always known about and been planning for and these plans are being activated this week is the, the peaks in demand. Uh, so we've had high demand, I, this has not just been in Scotland but um, we particularly particularly uh, had issues of high demand over the weekend into the early part of this week, which from the analysis we have done is very much related to concerns that parents understandably have about children with uh, coughs or, or colds uh, taking them for testing. That is why we are activating this week additional contingency measures. The uh, three additional mobile testing units that I uh, spoke about, NHS boards are bringing on additional NHS capacity. Greater Glasgow and Clyde is uh, this week uh, making drive-through facilities, additional drive-through facilities available. Um, and of course, we have then got the, the planned increases in capacity as we go into winter. So all of these issues uh, we are uh, working to resolve as they arise um, and continuing to try to advise people of when they should get a test uh, and when they shouldn't. And in short, um, there are some exceptions to this of test and protect uh, contacts you. And even though you don't have symptoms, if it advises you to get a test, you should get a test. For certain professions, there is agreed access to testing people working in schools for example but apart from uh, these exceptions you should only be booking a test right now if you have one of the symptoms of COVID uh, the cough the fever or the loss or change in your sense of taste or smell um, and it's in those circumstances that you should seek to book a test. Jamie Green to be followed by Alec Rowley. Thank you presiding officer uh, given that a decision uh, this week was made on obligatory face coverings for over five-year-olds on school transport and over 12-year-olds in other school settings. Uh, can the First Minister confirm that her government will guarantee a supply through whichever means necessary of PPE, if required by any family who may struggle to meet these obligations? First Minister. Um, I said, I think on Monday, and I said again yesterday, that we would work with uh, councils to make sure that schools have supplies of face coverings for young people should they need it, of course. I also made the point, which um, I, I'm sure people will understand is that uh, although we've changed the guidance this week rightly for school transport and for schools, children over five already require to use face coverings on public transport and in shops. So I would expect that uh, many children, if not most children, already have access to face coverings uh, already before the change to, to the school guidance this week. Uh, but it is important that schools have access to supplies because as the member rightly says, there, there may be some families who are not able uh, to make that uh, provision, uh, but there will also inevitably be children who forget to pick their face covering up before they leave home in the morning and come to school without it. So it's important that there is that access to supplies to cover that eventuality as well. And we've made clear that we will work with councils to ensure that's the case. Alec Rowley to be followed by Sandra White. Presiding officer, I was contacted this morning by a family of an elderly couple from Clark Manningshire and the couple had, on the advice of their GP, got a test uh, delivered to their house and they were, they were to phone and made arrangements on Monday and they, they were to do the test in the morning and then it would be picked up between eight and four. Uh, it was never picked up 
and by the time the family managed to get through, they've now been told the elderly couple need to take another test. And you've said yourself, First Minister, that these tests can be quite uh, uh, intrusive. So the question is, have we got the capacity? Are you confident that we've got the capacity? Because people are being let down. I've seen case after case after case. As we move into the winter, and as testing needs to be bumped up, almost to the point of getting to mass testing, do we have the capacity to do that? And will you ensure that? And can you also, when I'm on the subject, say where we are with the antibody tests and whether that's something that will also be introduced? First Minister. Um, I'll come back to antibody testing in, in a moment. Uh, uh, at these points, I, I, I wish I had the Chief Medical Officer standing next to me who can probably give a more specialist answer on, on that than, than I do. But on the, um, on the issues about testing, the issue about the, uh, your constituents who didn't get a test picked up, if, if you can send me the details of that, we will have that looked into. The home testing um, provision is part of the, the UK government administered system, uh, but we will work with them if there are practical uh, difficulties there. That shouldn't have happened, and I obviously don't know why uh, that did happen, but I would be keen to look into that. In terms of capacity, um, you know, yesterday, for example, there were, uh, I think, around 22,000 tests carried out across Scotland. We have uh, daily capacity right now in the region of 40,000 tests a day. We, are, we have plans in place to increase that to 60,000 uh, approximately tests a day. Uh, so we have and are, are confident in the plans we have to to build, to have that capacity right now and to build that capacity as we go into winter. One of the things which we have experienced this week, uh, which we have contingencies that are being activated, is there will inevitably be points where, capacity, where demand peaks uh, beyond the, the average level. And there may be reasons for that that we can foresee. There may be reasons for that that we, we don't foresee. For, you know, there may be a, a circulation of a, another virus in a particular area, or there may be a COVID outbreak in a particular area that increases demand. So one of the key uh, focuses for us this week has been ensuring that these contingency arrangements where we need perhaps short-term boosts in capacity uh, are there and can be activated. So these are uh, things that Health Secretary and, and I and, and others look at with our officials on a regular basis. Overall, our testing system is working well. Test and Protect is working very well, but we may face a period as we go into winter uh, where these pressures become much more significant again and therefore we are looking ahead to make sure we can cope with that. Um, on antibody testing we do antibody testing in Scotland for uh, surveillance purposes. Uh, the, the issue with antibody tests right now are, are, are twofold. Um, one is there is still questions although I think that the quality of the test is getting better and there are effective tests that are now available. But the biggest problem we still have with antibody testing is we don't really know what the results of an antibody test mean. Uh, so if somebody uh, has a, an antibody test and it tells them they have antibodies, we don't know whether that gives them immunity from COVID for a day, a week, a month, a year, forever. So there is still a real problem with asking anybody to make any decisions about how they live their lives on the basis of antibody testing. Now, hopefully that science will develop um, over uh, the, the weeks and months to come, but we don't yet know that. And of course, one of the developments we saw earlier this week from Hong Kong was researchers thinking that they may have discovered the first case of reinfection from COVID, which would suggest, and I don't think anybody can be definitive about this at this stage, but it would suggest that the period of immunity uh, may not be uh, that long. So that's w the, the, the biggest doubt that there still is around antibody testing, which is why I think we have to be cautious about the reliance we place on it. Thank you. We have quite a number of members who still want to ask questions and uh, emphasise concise questions, concise answers, please. Sandra White to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of concerns raised in regard to the future of nightclubs, music venues and stand comedy club in my constituency, which contribute greatly to the cultural scene and the economy in Glasgow and beyond. Can I ask the First Minister, therefore, what support the Scottish Government is and can give to these venues to ensure that they continue to operate and remain part of Scotland's vibrant music and comedy centre? Uh, well, can I thank Sandra White for raising uh, the, the issue. It is an important issue. Comedy is a, a very important part of our arts sector. We've already provided um, a range of 
uh, support initiatives for culture and the arts uh, generally and uh, many of those uh, support streams have been available to people in the, the comedy sector. We are in the uh, latter stages of uh, finalising how the remainder of the, the £97 million pounds of consequentials for arts and culture are going to be allocated um, and uh, without going into the detail of that because we are finalising that and hopefully we'll announce that over uh, the next few days uh, I would hope that that would also give uh, support for people in the comedy sector uh, but let me stress that we uh, are very keen to do everything we can uh, to provide the support uh, that is needed there uh, because of the importance of uh, the kind of venues um, and uh, the artists uh, bring and the contribution they bring to uh, our health and well-being as a country. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This government's woeful approach to weddings has left many frustrated couples with their lives on hold and the wedding industry on its knees, with hundreds of jobs at risk, including in my Dumfrieshire constituency. The First Minister gave a glimmer of hope last week when she confirmed that larger weddings might be able to take place from the middle of September. But does she recognise that by not giving an indicative number now, she's making it impossible for those couples and businesses to plan ahead, risking further jobs and adding to delays? First Minister. Uh, I'm, I, I will apologise to the member that we are trying in the government to take really difficult decisions in the best way we can in order to keep people safe from an infectious virus. If the member finds that woeful, then I'm afraid uh, there's not too much I can do um, about that. I understand the implications of these decisions for those who are affected and for businesses that are still not able to open at all or to operate uh, to full capacity. But we know from all of the data we are looking at right now that one of the biggest risks of transmission of this virus is indoor social uh, gatherings. That's why we have to take care. Um, in fact, when there was a, an outbreak in the north of England uh, a matter of weeks ago, uh, wedding receptions was one of the things that the UK government put on hold for a couple of weeks, which I think reflects the fact that we know that is a, a risk area. So we are uh, planning to uh, give new guidance that sets uh, the numbers that can be at wedding receptions. We hope to do that soon. Uh, but these decisions have to be taken very, very carefully um, for the reasons that I think people understand about the protection of human health, but also if we allow this virus to get out of control in any sector of our economy again, we risk sending those businesses backwards rather than supporting them to go forwards, even if sometimes that is supporting them to go forwards at a slightly slower pace than I know and understand that they want to go at. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Richard Lyle. The First Minister will have seen the front page of the Daily Record yesterday with the heartfelt plea of Mrs Midgley, who lost her son Simon in the devastating fire at Cameron House. She's written to the First Minister because it's been almost a thousand days since the fire and the families of those who lost loved ones still don't have answers from the Crown Office about what happened. Now, I'm sure the First Minister will sympathise with the severe and ongoing distress caused to Mrs Midgley by that lack of progress. So will she therefore seek an urgent update from the Crown Office and will she agree to meet with Mrs Midgley when she comes to Scotland? First Minister. Um, I, uh, I actually signed a reply to Mrs Midgley uh, last night, I think, so uh, she will receive that letter today or, or over the next couple of days. And uh, I do... Uh, deeply sympathise with her loss uh, and uh, the loss that her family has suffered and also the, the frustration which will be contributing to her grief of the delays in, in any process around uh, the investigation uh, of what happened at, at Cameron House. What I tried to set out in that letter, I'm not going to get into all the detail because it is a, a letter to uh, her obviously, is explain the reasons, and Jackie Bailey already understands these reasons, that no matter my personal uh, feelings and the, the anguish I feel on her behalf, I cannot and it simply would not be right for me to seek to intervene in any decisions about criminal investigations or potential criminal uh, prosecutions. And I know that is always hard for uh, victims or people who suffer loss to understand, but I do not serve them well unless I set that out clearly. Um, the, Crown Office, I'm sure, would give Jackie Bailey uh, an update. It is simply not appropriate for me to seek to direct the Crown Office in these matters in any way. Uh, I would, of course, uh, be willing to meet uh, with Mrs Bidgley if she wants to do that when I come to Scotland. But, of course, I, I don't want uh, either myself or Jackie Bailey on my behalf 
to raise her expectations about what I can reasonably do in the context of criminal investigations. I don't think that would be fair to her or fair to her family, although I absolutely understand her anguish and you know, want to again today convey uh, my deep condolences and sympathy to her um, and her loved ones for what they are suffering. Richard Lyle to be followed by Gordon Linders. Thank you, President Officer. I refer members to my register of interests. First Minister, fun fairs can again operate since last Monday, but due to present Scottish local government licensing laws, show people may not be able to hold a local fun fair for at least another three months. Show people have not had any income since last March. Due to present COVID-19 application requirements, they have not been able to access any funding or even the uh, tour tourism uh, fund. This is due to not being entitled previously to the small business bonus or the fact that they do not have a business bank account. Both these facts have ensured that their applications have been refused and have been this has been confirmed to me by the agencies that operate the funds. Can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will re review these conditions in order that show people may access any funding in order to survive and bring back the fund to Scotland. First Minister. I'm all for bringing back fun in whatever uh, way we can get it. Um, but obviously I, I'm not going to give a commitment to retrospectively uh, change the conditions on funds that will have already been uh, dispersed. Obviously, as we put in place any new support, we will look at the kind of representations uh, that Richard Lyle has made uh, we know it's important that fun fairs can start to operate again as quickly and as safely as, as they can. Uh, beyond that, in terms of some of the detail of his question, uh, I'm happy to have that looked into and respond to him in writing to see if there's anything further we can do. Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister the cost of the Scottish Government's participation in the People's Action on Section 30 case in light of the recent decision to pull out of that case and whether that decision ushers in a new era of prudence for the Scottish Government regarding spending of public funds on legal actions. First Minister. The Scottish Government is always aims to be prudent in the use of uh, public money. I don't have the detail uh, to hand on his question. I'm happy to uh, see if we can ask, uh, get that and provide it to him later. Thank you, and apologies to more than a dozen members who we didn't get a chance to uh, reach, but that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to suspend and resume at 2.30 with a statement on the life sciences. Parliament is suspended.